Hello and welcome to Holy Impact Ministries Bible Study Night, a HolyImpactMinistries.com production. I'm Pastor Scott Belaine. God bless you and thank you for sharing your time with us here today. It is uh, Wednesday night, 8 o'clock, where we always have our uh, Bible study, and we are studying the book of Romans, and we are going to be going into the third chapter of the book of Romans, and uh, we will be taking a look at the writings of the Apostle Paul, and uh, we also are going to be taking a look at the warnings of uh, the writings of the Apostle Paul. Now, if, for those of you who have been with us from the beginning, from chapter 1, and we, we highly encourage you to, to please start at the beginning of this study. There are many things that we will have, uh, many questions that we will have already answered in previous chapters that we will not answer in every single chapter. Uh, however, there is one important scripture that we need to look at anytime we look at the writings of Paul. Again, we know that the writings of Paul, uh, uh, actually, two-thirds of the New Testament, or the Brit Hadashah, uh, are the writings of Paul. So if we get the writings of Paul wrong or incorrect, we are going to get over two-thirds of the New Testament wrong, as so many have done. So we've, it's very imperative that we get the writings of Paul correct. And we know and understand exactly what Paul was saying uh, before we proceed. So before we get started here, for those of you uh, who have been with us, I apologize. Please stick with us, but we have to go through this for people who may be just tuning in brand new and have no idea of what we're looking at here. I want to take them to uh, 2 Peter 3.16. Let's jump over there very quickly. Uh, let's see here. 2 Peter and we're going to go to 3.16. This is the warning from the Apostle Peter. And this is what he says about the writings of the Apostle Paul. He starts here in 3.16. He says, There are some things in them, talking about the writings of Paul, that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and the unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. So, in other words, the writings of Paul cannot be taken at face value. You cannot just read the writings of Paul and think that you're going to understand the writings of Paul. They are hard to understand because of the many challenges that he had and the, uh, the different people that were coming against him with these different accusations that he had to uh, avert. Uh, so we need to know and understand these things if we're going to understand the writings of Paul. Peter tells us, he said, the ignorant and the unstable, and I want to highlight this, the ignorant and the unstable would twist the writings of Paul to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. So, so I want us to really hone in on this and remember this as we're going through the writings of Paul, because it seems like Paul is speaking against the law at one minute, and then he's speaking for the law the next minute. Now, we know that Paul never never was really preaching against circumcision or the law. And we can prove that out through the scriptures if we will simply look at the scriptures, know the scriptures, and understand the scriptures. And that's what we're doing here today, is we're parsing out the deception from the reality of what Paul was saying. So again, the ignorant and the unstable will twist uh, Paul's writings to their own destruction, as they do the other uh, scriptures. And then Peter gives a warning here. He says, You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, he says, I'm telling you this, so now that you know it, he says, Take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people, people that are full of iniquity. Okay? And it is uh, very important. I mean, this, this warning really says it all. If you're lawless and you do not have the law, if you do not understand the law, it is part of faith. Uh, in that the, the written law is separate and apart from faith, which the faith includes the law. We're going to take a look at that this evening and study a, a little bit about what faith actually is when Paul talks about faith uh, and what the Bible says, what the biblical definition of faith is. Uh, we'll know a little bit more and we'll understand this a little bit better, but I find it very interesting that Peter just nails it on the head when he says, take care that you're not carried away with the error of lawless people who want to throw the law away or nail it to the cross, uh, we can assure you at HolyImpactMinistries.com, God's laws are not nailed to the cross. And we're going to prove that out to you as we, uh, as we continue on here. But uh, with all of that being said, 
I just want to thank you for, for joining us uh, today. We're going to try and get through uh, chapters uh, 3 and maybe 4, depending on how things go. And uh, as we do that, let me see here. I seem to be stuck in... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm in the wrong book here. I just want to make sure I'm setting us up uh, for the right chapter. Uh, as we do all of these things, uh, we are all, we're going to be looking at other scripture throughout the Bible to, to, to gather this in and to hone this in and to zero in on exactly what Paul is saying. Now, we have to know the biblical definition of what righteousness is, and we've done that in, in previous chapters. So, you, again, you want to take a look at those previous chapters so you know what we're talking about. Today, we're really going to hone in on the biblical definition of faith and what faith is, and we're going to show you how you can know and understand what faith is. Faith is not just saying, I believe, I believe, I believe. Faith has fruit. Faith is obedience. Faith has works. And we're going to prove that out to you as we go. Uh, faith does not, we do not nullify the law by our faith. On the contrary, we uphold the law, says the Apostle Paul. Okay, so we're going to take a look at that all today. I want you to have a cup of coffee. I want you to relax. Have a paper, a pen, or an electronic device if you're keeping everything on electronic devices. And then, and I want to say this. If you're keeping everything on a laptop like I usually do because it's just so much faster and easier, please, my friends, print these things out and have a hard copy of these things. If we get a solar flare or if an EMP attack was to come upon us and these electrical devices are not worth anything any more than a paperweight, uh, you're going to lose all the information on all the studies that you've done. Please print them out. Print them out. Have a hard copy of them uh, so that you can keep them with you and we can teach our children uh, these things. It's very important uh, to go through all of this and then not to have our notes and, and all of the things that we've studied and looked at uh, would be just absolutely horrible. Again, you can download the videos that we have here at HolyImpactMinistries.com, including this Bible study. They're free. They don't cost anything. You burn them to a DVD, tear them apart, play them back and forth, uh, design your own Bible studies out of them, however, you, whatever you want to do with them uh, it, it is up to you. But we just ask that you please don't sell them. But everything we do at Holy Impact Ministries is free and free for the download, free for the taking. And uh, we are actually working on right now a system where we can put some of these CDs together. If you don't have a CD burner and you don't have the knowledge of how to do this thing, these things, uh, you can purchase them for a couple of dollars. Uh, and we'll send them out to you. Uh, so we're working on that as we as we speak uh, at the beginning of this year. So at any rate, let's take a quick little break here. Uh, have a cup of coffee or glass of milk if you're getting ready for bed or a tea or whatever it is that you like. Uh, just be comfortable. I want you to be comfortable to sit for a little while because this may take a little bit of time to get through. But I want to go through this with you and I want to do the very best that I can to help you understand the writings of the Apostle Paul. Mm, very good coffee. Okay. God bless you. Now, before we get started, again, this is a very difficult uh, section of the Word of God. And we're going to pray before we start out to ask Yahweh God the Father to give us the discernment that we need to be able to understand these things. So let's start out with a prayer very quickly so that he can help each and every person that watches this video uh, understand exactly what it is we're saying and exactly what it is that Paul, more importantly, is saying. So let's begin. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, we pray, Father, hallowed is your holy name, high and far above all names. We thank you, Lord God, for your mercy and for your grace and for the blood that covers our heads. We thank you, Lord, for the air that we breathe and the ground that we stand on. And we ask this day, Father, we come before you in the name of Yeshua and ask that each and every person that watches this video, this Bible study that we are joining together to go through, would have the discernment to know and to understand the truth of the writings of the Apostle Paul, that they may have the truth in their hearts and in their minds. We love you very much, Father, and we pray this in your holy name, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. All right, very good. And we it's always a good idea when you're going through something rough like this, something that's difficult to understand, something we've been warned about by the Apostle Peter, to pray and ask for that discernment. Because discernment does not come from me or in any pastor. It comes from him, and that's where it comes from. There is no mediator between you and Yahweh God the Father. 
I am certainly no mediator. I am just nothing more than a teacher, a pastor that warns the flock and tries to keep them gathered in uh, to be protected from the deception that is out there in the world. So uh, we need to know and understand that our understanding doesn't come from any man, any pastor, priest, bishop, or pope. It comes from Yahweh God the Father. And we know that if we read uh, Matthew 17, or I'm sorry, 23, uh, we can read through that chapter and know and understand. He says, Call no man rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you're all brothers. And call no man uh, your father on this earth, and he's talking about a spiritual father, because you have one father who is in heaven. And call no man your instructor, because you have one instructor, the Christ. Now we know also that uh, in the book of Ephesians, he gives many pastors and he gives teachers and what have you to help the body of Christ along. But no man is your instructor. He is the instructor. And this is why we pray uh, in the beginning uh, of the Bible study, especially when we're going into a, a tough situation here like we are now. This is a little bit difficult to understand. We want that discernment to come from him. Now, I can speak it all day long, but if that discernment does not come from him, you will not understand what we're studying here today. So it's always important that we go to our prayer closets and at times pray together and worship him uh, the way Yeshua HaMashiach Jesus did in his prayer when he taught us how to pray. And that's another Bible study. We'll get into that another time. But let's move into the book of Romans and let's see what we can glean from the writings of the Apostle Paul and whether he did or did not preach and teach against circumcision and the laws of God. Romans 3.1, let's go ahead and begin there. It says, Then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the value of circumcision? Now let's stop right there for just a moment. Now, I want you to think about this question that Paul is asking in the very first line of Romans 3. What is the advantage of the Jew? What, is there, what advantage is there of being a Jew? And what value is there of circumcision? Think about this. Now, if a newsman from a news television network, were to go stand outside almost any church, USA, okay, and I speak of USA because I just know what's going on here in the United States of America, but I, I, it is all over the world, Australia or China or wherever, to go to a Christian church and to stand outside with a microphone and ask this question, what do you think the answer to any given professing Christian would be? What do you think that they would say in today's modern day version of Christianity? If he, if someone held the mic to a, a Christian standing outside of a church as they were coming out on Sunday, which is the wrong day of the week, and he said, what is the advantage of being a Jew and what is the value of circumcision? What do you think that Christian would answer today? Chances are very good, my friends, that they would say, well, there's no advantage of being a Jew. We have re The Gentile church has replaced the Jewish people. They've been divorced by God, and they're no good anymore. And there's no value of circumcision because the laws of God have been nailed to the cross, and we no longer obey the laws of God. We're once saved, always saved. That's most likely what you're going to get. Or, we live in a dispensational state of grace. So we don't have to pay attention to those old, nasty laws that are a curse and bondage. That's what you would probably hear from today's modern-day version of Christianity or today's modern-day Christian. Because this is what they've been taught. And again, this comes from ancient Catholicism and has drifted into even the Protestant churches. But this is what Paul says. How does he answer this question? What advantage has the Jew, or what value of circumcision is there? He says, much in every way. That's a little different answer, isn't it? Much in every way, Paul says. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. My friends, before we go any farther, I want you to know and I want you to understand that Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, was called Rabbi. They called him Rabbi Yeshua. He came from the house of David. He came from the tribe of Judah. He was a Jew, and it is the blood of a Jew. It is the blood of a Jew that covers the transgressions of the whole world. And we need to know that, and we need to accept that. You know, if we've got people sitting out there today that are full of anti-Semitism and people that hate the Jews and all of this other kinds of thing, we need to back up, we need to know, and we need to understand who our Messiah was to begin with. 
And if we don't believe that, all we have to do is go back to the second chapter. We already covered this, and, and I'll just go back for a second. Uh, let's see here. Um, the first one, the first chapter. This is when Paul Paul's introduction. What does he say here? He says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who, listen to this now, who was, a de, who was descended from David according to the flesh. There's no doubt that our Messiah came from the house of David and the tribe of Judah. It was the Jews who brought forth our Messiah. And we get this right away from the first chapter of Romans. So uh, I want us to know and I want us to understand this. So he says, to begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. And they were entrusted. And you see, many times we, t we see Paul refers to everything that he says first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. First to the Jew and then to the Gentile. Why first to the Jew? Because they were here first. Because they brought the law to the world. They did this. They, they brought the oracles of God to the world. They brought the knowledge of God to the world. Now, yes, they tripped up and they, they stumbled and they fell all over the place uh, and they had a hard time. But they did bring Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, into the world. And that is a gift uh, that no man can match. So we need to know and we need to understand this. And I just want to make that very clear from the get. Paul says, much in every way to be an advantage uh, if you're a Jew. And that there is, a, is there a value of circumcision? He says, much in every way. So again, Paul not preaching against circumcision here, is he? Let's continue on. He says, what if some were unfaithful? Now he's talking, I want you to know and understand, he's talking to the, the uh, Pharisees now. Remember, Paul himself is a Pharisee. He knows what they're thinking, and they're constantly saying you have to be circumcised in order to be saved. You have to be circumcised in order to be saved. And Paul's telling them, he says, you have to have faith first. And let me do this very quickly, because this might help us. I'm just going to take two pieces of paper here, and I'm going to write, uh, let me grab a pen, never, never a pen here, when I want one. I'm going to write faith on one piece of paper. Okay. Faith. Uh, now, this is not very good writing, because I'm not a very good writer. But I think you can see that. Faith. This is, says faith. Okay, faith. Okay, and I'm going to put obedience. To the law. Okay, obedience to the law on the other piece of paper, okay? Obedience to the law, I hope you can see that. If not, this says faith, and this says obedience to the law, okay? Now, what Paul is trying to get through to these Pharisees is that faith, if you have faith, you have obedience to the law. You will do the things of God because you have faith. Faith comes first. Obedience to the law is not ripped up and torn away and taken away. It just follows faith. Okay, so so here's faith. It's up front. And obedience to the law, of course, follows. Why? Because in the New Covenant, what does the New Covenant say? What is the New Covenant all about? We covered this last week. Uh, the New Covenant says that God would write his laws, right, on the hearts and the minds of his people. He didn't say he'd nail them to the cross or get rid of them. He said, I will write my laws on their hearts and in their minds. That's the new covenant. We went through that last week. Please, again, if you haven't seen that, take a look at that. So faith is what you need, and it's all you need because it encompasses all of these things. Okay, It encompass, encompasses obedience to the things of God. And his feast days and all of those types of things are all wrapped up within his law. Okay, his Sabbath, all of that is, is written down in the law. What is going, what was going on, was the Pharisees had made the law their god. The written law was now their god. Okay, and that's what was going on. So they were really worshiping the law instead of worshiping Yahweh God the Father, trying to understand what the law was about and why it was written. Uh, it, they just wanted to just worship the law. Worship the law. It was all about the law and doing the law and earning their way into heaven. And Yeshua came to, to smash that with an iron rod like a clay pot. 
and he did that. And uh, we need to know and understand that. So as we go through this, we I want you to know and understand what Paul is trying to say to these Pharisees. He begins talking to these Pharisees. He says, what if some were unfaithful? He says, does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness? Let me get back over here. I'm going to do this again and forget what screen I'm on here. And for some reason, we jumped to the wrong uh, chapter. Here we go. Okay, and here we are in Romans 3.3, 3, picking it up here. It says, what if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means, he says. Just because you're unfaithful, that doesn't nullify his faithfulness. He says, let God be true and every man a liar as it's written, so that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? He says, I speak in a human way. In other words, he's being kind of sarcastic here. He says, by no means. He said, for then how could God judge the world? Now, this is philosophy. And philosophy had, uh, of Aristotle and Plato and Socrates, had seeped into the Pharisaical uh, rabbinical code and uh, the Talmudic law. And they were looking at things in their own mind, their own human minds, and their own thinking, right? And Paul was telling him, you need to throw that away. You need to throw that whole idea away. Your unrighteousness does not make God righteous. God is righteous regardless of whether you're righteous or not. And that's what he's trying to say here. He says, by no means, for then how could God judge the world? But if through my lie, God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as sinner? And why not do evil that good may come? As some people slanderously charge us with saying. He says their condemnation is just. So once again, Paul has people that are just constantly on him, calling him a liar and t saying that he's preaching against circumcision, he's preaching against the law, and these Pharisees just won't have it. And there's this big argument. Of course, we talked a little bit about that, uh, I think it was last week as well in chapter 2, about uh, Paul having to take this argument of the Pharisees, this circumcision group, to, to James in the book of Acts. And you can find that in Acts 15, uh, that argument, so we highly suggest that you go uh, look at last week's study so that you can understand that James's uh, judgment was not against circumcision in any way, shape, or form. If we just read the text, we can know that. But uh, at any rate, I just want to kind of keep this in uh, perspective here. They were calling Paul a liar, and they were saying that you had to be circumcised in order to be saved. And Paul's going to make some very, uh, some very good points here as we go along. But for the unlearned and for those who do not know and understand their scriptures, it could seem that Paul was speaking against circumcision and against the law. He was not. Uh, and we're, we just we need to know that. We need to understand that to keep all of this uh, in the right context. So, he says, uh, but if through my lie uh, it abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned a sinner? And he says... Uh, once again, he says, and why not do evil that good may come, as some people slanderously charge us with saying, their condemnation is just. He says, that's not what we're saying. And then, he says, what then? He says, are the Jews any better off? He says, not at all. He says, for we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. Now, we've talked about this from the beginning of this study in chapter 1. Paul's whole premise here, his whole duty here, his whole job is to, to take these Pharisees down, pull their heads out of the clouds because they have the law and they're circumcised and they think they're all up here. It's to pull them down, grab them by their feet and plant their feet on the ground and make them realize that we are all one. We have all been grafted into the same olive tree. We are all family all of us, you are not above the Jews or you are not above the Greeks uh, in any way. And these new converts, okay, together we are grafted in. And this is where he starts to do that. He says, are the Jews better off? He says, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jew and Gentile, the Greek, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks God. All have turned aside together. They have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave in their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. 
In their paths are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Okay, so he says this is both for Jew and Gentile, both. No one knows God the way they should. No one fo follows him, <clears throat> excuse me, the way that they should. Okay, now let's continue on because this next uh, verse in Romans 3.19, very important for us to get through. Now we know that whatever the law says, and here we are down here in the red, I've just made it blue. <laughs> now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. So Paul knows that the whole world will be judged by God's law. And that's exactly what he's saying right here. Okay, we shouldn't have any discrepancies about that. We can read this. We can know what it says. It's not written backwards. No decoder ring is needed. Uh, no crystal ball. It says, we know that the whole world may be held accountable by or, or accountable to God because of his law. And that's what he will be, they, we will be judged by. Now, listen to what he says down here. It says, for by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Now, this can be extremely uh, difficult to understand. I want us to understand uh, right away the difference between the law by itself and the law of faith. How many people even know that there is a law of faith? In the Bible, there is a law of faith. And um, let's see here. I want to take you to a picture that I have here. Um, let me see if I can find that for you here. I think I had brought that up. Yes, I did. And let's go back and we'll take a look at that picture. Now, I want us to see this. This is what faith encompasses according to the Word of God. Okay, faith. If we have faith, we have these things. This is what faith is, okay? Everything else is outside of faith, okay? All of these sins and all of these things are outside of faith. And these things do not get into the nucleus of faith, if we have faith. Faith, first of all, is the love of God, okay? The love of God is the first and foremost thing. What is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength, right? You can find that in Matthew 22, 37. Faith bears fruit, okay? There is evidence of your faith. What did Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, our Messiah say? You will know them by their fruits, okay? Now, if faith has no fruit and there is no evidence, then how will you judge a man by his fruits? Faith has fruits. And we know that if we look at John 2, 4. Okay, very quickly, let's go ahead and let's just take a look at John 2, 4, uh, for those of you who don't know. John 2 and, uh, let's see here, 1 John 2, 4. There it is. Okay, 1 John 2, 4 says, Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But if whoever keeps his word, in him truly the, the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Okay, do we understand that now? So once again, we can see that faith bears fruit. If you say you know him and you're not following his commandments, then you're a liar and the truth's not in you. And that goes for any man. That goes for me, you, everyone. So we can know and understand that obedience also comes with faith if you have faith. Let's look at 1 John 5, 3. So we're going to take a look at 1 John 5, 3. What does it say? For this is the love of God. This is the biblical definition of the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Okay? So this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. This is included in faith. What was included in faith? The greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength. This is included in faith. Faith also includes obedience, 1 John 5, 3. Let's take a look at 1 John 5, 3 here. Oh, we just did that. That was obedience. If we love God, we will be doing the things of God, and they will not be 
burdensome, will obey his commandments, and they will not be burdensome. Uh, upholds the law. Okay, again, let's go to, we're going to jump ahead in the third chapter of Romans, which we're already in. We're going to just go ahead and jump down to the bottom. Okay, and we're going to go to Romans 3, and we're going to jump down to the bottom. And what does Paul say down here? And I hope you can see that. Yeah, I think so. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? Now there's your question. Do we overthrow the law by our faith? What does he say? By no means. And he says again, on the contrary, we uphold the law. This is Paul speaking, the same person who many of these biblical scholars and doctors say is preaching against the law. So faith includes obedience to the law. So let's go back and take a look at that again. When we see the word faith, we can know and understand what faith is is and what it encompasses okay if you do not have these things then you do not have faith okay so i want us to know and understand when paul is speaking against the law he's talking about the law without faith okay he's saying if you're just keeping that written law you're going to be lost because you're still going to be sacrificing animals which you don't need to do because we've already had our messiah who came who was a propitiation for sins you don't need to sacrifice animals anymore Okay, there still needs to be a payment made, but the payment was made. So has the law changed? Not really. No, it hasn't changed. There had to be a payment made, a blood sacrifice for your sin. Was there? Yes, there was. Okay, that's what Yeshua came to die for. Penalty for breaking the law. What is the, what is the uh, biblical definition of sin? The biblical definition of sin is to transgress the law. If you transgress the law, you have sinned. What is the wages of sin? The wages of sin is death. That's what Yeshua came to do away with. The law of sin and death. He did away with that penalty. He did not do away with the laws of God. So I think this will help us to know and understand what faith is and why does Paul say you don't need the law you just have you just need faith because in faith you will be driven to obedience and to do the things of the law okay it 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 encompasses obedience to god if we love god what will we do then for this is the love of god that we keep his commandments and they are not burdensome that's what the that's what the the bible says the biblical definition of faith is we need to know that so that when we hear Paul talking against the law, he's talking about the law without faith, the law by itself. We can't follow that. We cannot follow that. That is gone. Okay. We must follow the law because we want to follow the law. We can't. Uh, it's kind of like this. Let me ex let me explain this to you, and see if this helps. Have you ever been over to Grandma's house? You go over to Grandma's house, and what's the first thing she wants to do most, most, with most grandmas? Not every grandma, but most grandmas. What do they want to do? They want to feed you, don't they? They want to feed you. Now, they work in the kitchen, and they slave in the kitchen to make this apple pie and to make all of these desserts and cookies and all of these things when you go to Grandma's house, right? And to her, is that work? No, it's not work at all. It's not work. She does it because it pleases people. To her, it is something that she yearns to do. She wants to do it. She, and she wants to give it to you. She wants to feed you. She wants you to be full. She wants to give you something you remember her by, right? It's not work. Now, there's some guy who goes to a cook in a kitchen and works as a cook in a kitchen. Is cooking work? It sure is. He's got to stand there all day flipping hamburgers or whatever it is he's making. Cooking in the kitchen to him is work. He doesn't really want to be there. He'd rather be doing something else. He'd rather be on vacation in the Bahamas. Uh, cooking is not something he wants to do. It's work. That's the same way it is with God's laws, my friends. Work is something that you have to do and you earn something. Okay, You get something. You're working so that you can get something. When grandma makes a pie and she gives you something, is she trying to get something? No, she's not trying to get anything. She wants to give. She knows what it is to give. She wants to please you. She wants you to love her. And she wants to give you. She wants you to know that she loves you. That's what that's all about, you see. And that's the same way with God's laws. They no longer are work. What is the love of God? What does it say? That we obey his commandments and they are not burdensome. We want to keep the laws of God, not to earn our way in, 
okay? But because we already have that hope of that salvation given to us already, we see what he has done. We see what his son went through. We see what sin is. We see how wretched and how naked and how, how horrible that we are, that he had to send his only begotten son to die on a cross for our iniquities because we couldn't stop it. So we know these things. This is faith, my friends. This is faith. And that's why faith comes first and it actually fuels obedience, okay? If you have faith, you have the love of God, you'll want to do the things of God because you love him. That's why. And that's different than putting the law up here and saying, I'm going to earn my way into heaven because if I do the law, I earn my way and you need to just get out of the way uh, there, uh, St. Peter at the pearly gates, because I've earned my way into heaven. No, that's not going to work. What did Yeshua say? He said, many come, will come to me in that day and they will say, Lord, Lord, have we not done many miracles in your name? Have we done, not done many great works in your name? And he's going to look at them and he's going to say, I don't even know you. Get away from me, you who are full of iniquity. That's going to be these people right here who believe that they can earn their way into uh, the gates of heaven through the law. They can't. They can't. And people who do not have faith. If you don't have faith, they never did believe in Yeshua HaMashiach. They didn't have any inkling to want to, to obey him or to keep his Sabbaths or, or keep his days holy or his appointments or his Moedim. They did nothing. They're full of iniquity. And he does not know them and they do not know him. Okay, that's going to be a horrible thing for people who have been lied to all of these generations. It's going to be a horrible thing when they get there and say, look what I've done. And Jesus says, I don't even know you. Hit the bricks. Go away. You're full of iniquity. Because these are people who believe that in their own vanity that they have earned their way into heaven. After what Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, did for them. They still think that they've earned their way in. And they make his uh, burial, death, burial, and crucifixion of no effect. Making void the law of God in order to hold on to their own traditions. Okay, so uh, we have that down, I think. Let's go ahead and continue on. Uh, and this will help us to understand uh, the thinking of, of Paul as he's talking uh, uh, about uh, what we may think he's talking about as far as getting rid of or not having anything to do with the law. So let's continue on. He says, so uh, by works from the law, apart from faith, he says, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. He says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. This is where faith comes in. And what does faith encompass? We already know these things. It encompasses the law. It includes the law, right? although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. So let's read that again. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, because it's the written law on paper. The righteousness of God through faith, what does faith encompass? We've already seen that. Okay, The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction for all who all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Faith. Okay, we believe that he did what he did. We see what he did. We know it all locks in. We know he was prophesied. We see the prophecies in the Old Testament that he was coming. We see even the Passover. Everything points to him. We know these things. We know it was him. And we have faith that he indeed is our Messiah, just as he said. And he laid himself down on the cross and gave his very life for us. That's faith, my friends. Okay, and because of that, we follow and are obedient to the things of God, and they are not burdensome to us, okay? This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus, okay? Who has faith in the Messiah. Then what becomes of our boasting? So once again, he's saying, you know, if you're just obeying the law, thinking you're going to earn your way in, he says, you're going to, you, you can't boast. If you have faith, there is no boasting. He says, it's excluded. By what kind of law? 
by a law of works, apart from faith? No, he says, but by the law of faith. You see, there is a law of faith. What's the law of faith? We just saw it right here. It is love God first. It bears fruit. It has obedience. We uphold the law. If you have faith, you're doing these things. This is all encompassed within faith. Okay. Okay. The law of faith. You can call it the circle of faith, the law of faith, uh, the nucleus of faith. You know what faith is. And uh, we need to know and we need to understand these things. It is just so, so very important that we understand these things. And we're going to prove that out as we go. Don't worry. Uh, those are not the only things that we have to prove uh, our point. We're going to prove it much more as we move forward. So he says, so for we hold that one is justified by faith, okay, by faith, by this, apart from the works of the law, apart from the works of the law. So in other words, you can't just keep the law without faith. Okay, you must have faith. You can't just have obedience to the law and just get rid of this and take faith and just get rid of it. You can't. It does that doesn't work. You might as well just turn it upside down, tear it up, throw it away. It doesn't work. This doesn't work. You must have this because this includes this. This obedience to the law is in faith. Okay, let's understand what did Peter say? The writings of Paul were hard to understand. But if we understand the definition of what faith is and what the, the definition of righteousness is, we can clearly see. And down here at the very bottom, uh, Paul really nails it, uh, nails it down for us. Okay, so he says, Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since God is one, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised by faith? Now, we're going to get into this uncircumcision and circumcision once again. We're going to... because. Boy, he's just really having a hard time with these Pharisees. The, the Pharisees had what, the, what was known in the Bible as the circumcision group. And once again, they were running around telling these new converts, they were scaring them off, saying, you've got to be circumcised or you're not saved. Okay, And that's the first thing they were telling them. Instead of telling them the truth of what Yeshua has done for them, so that there could be a circumcision of the heart, so that the laws could be written on their heart, so that they could know how much God loves them. No, they didn't want to tell them that. They wanted to tell them they had to be circumcised first. It was the first thing that came out of their mouth. Again, very mechanical. We have to earn your way in. And that's what these Pharisees were telling these new converts. And Paul was telling them, stop it. Stop it. You are frightening them and scaring them away. Nobody wants to do this. And if they don't have faith, if they don't know what the Messiah has done, if you don't have this, these new converts are not going to be circumcised. They're not going to want to follow the, the laws of God because they're not going to know why to follow the, war, the laws of God. You must introduce this properly. And of course, that was the decision that James had when he went in the book of Acts. Uh, and he took the, in the book of Acts, the 15th chapter, he took that to uh, James. And what did James say? He gave them four things to do. Stay away from strang uh, strangled animals and blood and idolatry and all of these things. Four things out of the law, very easy to keep. And he says, then, he said, they will hear the laws of Moses being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. And they'll know that circumcision is part of the law. And because they will now have faith, okay, they will have been doing the things of God. They will hear what Yeshua Jesus Christ has done for them. They will know how it all fits in nice and neatly. They will then, their faith will grow, and they will be led to do and have obedience to the things of God, and to keep his feast days, and to keep his Sabbaths, and to keep all of the things that God said, because they know that this is what God wants them to do. But you must have this first, because if you're not driven by this, everything else is, is not going to work. And we talked about, oftentimes to explain this even in a better way, is to use baptism in place of circumcision. You cannot force someone to be baptized. If you force them to be baptized and they have not been baptized by their own accord and made their own decision to walk down to that water and to be baptized and to confess with their tongue and to repent of their ways, then they are not baptized. You can baptize babies all day long. They're not baptized because they haven't made the decision in their own mind and in their own heart to be baptized. Uh, again, it is blasphemous to baptize babies who have no concept of what they're even doing. Uh, it, it is ridiculous. You cannot do it. And it's the same thing with circumcision. Circumcision is a spiritual thing that we do. 
Baptism is a spiritual thing that we do. And if it is not done as such, then it is nullified and it is void. Okay, It has to be done because our hearts have led us to do so. Because we get it, we understand, and we accept personally the gift that was given at the cross. Okay? So, in the last line here, Paul really nails it down, and he just asks, Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? It's right down here at the bottom. And he just asks flatly. Flatly. And he answers it flatly. He says, By no means, he says. By no means we do not nullify the law or overthrow the law by our faith. On the contrary, he says, we uphold the law. Okay, is that clear enough for everyone? I, I think that should be clear enough for everyone. And what did he say in uh, chapter 2? He said, it's not the hearers of the law who will be justified, but the doers of the law. What does the book of James say? Same thing. We've, we've compared those scriptures. We know exactly what Paul was preaching and what he's not. If we know the definition of what faith is, and when Paul talks about the law, he's talking about the law apart from faith. You can't have the law apart from faith. Okay, which is what the Pharisees were used to doing. They were just used to following the law. They, the faith, they didn't understand faith. What was faith? What does that have to do with anything? So, uh, and this is what Paul was trying to pound into their, their hearts and their minds is, hey, listen, this is what Yeshua did. You hung him on the cross. He was the Passover lamb for the whole world. He was the propitiation for sin. It has been done. And look, at what you have done. This is what sin costs. This is what, when you overwrite the laws of God through your Talmudic laws and all of your man-made laws, this is what happens. This is the face of sin. You want to see what sin is like? Look at what Yeshua did at the cross. Look at the men, the evil that was in them that mocked him and stripped him of his clothes and beat him and whipped him and scourged him. This is sin, my friends. You should have a nostril full of it. And you should know and understand what sin is by simply looking at what happened to our Messiah and why he does not want us to be involved with sin and why God cannot have sin around him. Okay, let's take a, a quick break here and we're going to have a, a cup of coffee, a little drink of coffee here, and we're going to move on to chapter 4. Now, this is going to be a little bit of a long setting. If you want to, you can pause this video if you like, but I want to move through these scriptures because we have other books we want to get through here in studies as well. So we want to kind of move through them. Uh, and sometimes just taking one chapter a night, we can do that if we need to. But uh, we want to go through, try and go through a couple where we can. And tonight we're going to do these two chapters. So we're going to move on to Romans chapter 4. And I think you're going to find this extremely interesting as well. Oh, good coffee. I love coffee, especially in the wintertime. <clears throat> Coffee in the wintertime, tea in the summertime. How great is that? Okay, what a blessing. Uh, all right, let's begin in Romans 4, 1. He says this. He says, What shall we, we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the Scripture say? And we're going to look at what the Scripture says. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Okay? Well, stop right there. Let's just stop right there. Now, I have some things that I want us to uh, take a look at. Let's jump over to Genesis 15.5, because this is what Paul's quoting from. So let's understand, again, Paul is a Pharisee. He already knows these things. The Pharisees already know these things, but we don't. So let's know what he's talking about. What is he quoting from when he says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness? What is he saying? Well, what he's saying is uh, in found in Genesis, uh, I believe that was 15.5. Uh, 15 and 5. Okay, very good. And what does he say here? And 15.5, he says, he, And he brought him outside and said, Look towards heaven and the number of stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, shall, So shall be your offspring. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. Now, we're going to go ahead and highlight that. I should have had that highlighted already. Okay? So this is what Paul's talking about. Okay? 
because Abraham believed Yahweh God the Father, it, it was counted to him as righteousness. But I want us to see um, another scripture as well. Uh, 26, Genesis 26, 4, 5. I have that prepared for us here, I think. Genesis, uh, and that was 26, and 4 and 5. Listen to this now. This is why this uncircumcised Gentile by the name of Abraham was chosen to be the father of all nations. Let's listen. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and will give your offspring all uh, these lands. And in your offspring, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because, because, and here it is, why? Because Abraham obeyed my voice, he kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Many people wrongly believe that the laws were given at Mount Sinai through Moses. Well, here we have Abraham way before Moses. And what is he obeying? He's obeying God's voice, his charge, his commandments, his statutes, and his laws. My friends, the laws were given at creation. God's laws have been around from the very beginning of time. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He's not going to care about his laws in the beginning, not care about them today, and then care about them again in the end. When we know that they are reinstituted in the book of Revelations, it tells us very clearly. Okay? So if he's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, does it make sense that he would care about his laws in the beginning, care about his laws in the end, and he wouldn't care about them in the middle? No. It doesn't make any sense. This is why God chose Abraham very clearly in the book of Genesis because Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, kept my commandments, kept my statutes, and he kept my laws. Okay? So let's know what Paul knows. Let's know what Paul knows. Okay, that Paul knows this and these Pharisees know this. Okay? So let's not let we shouldn't be ignorant of this. Okay? We should know this as well. So now that we know why why Abraham was chosen, let's go back to the book of Romans in the fourth chapter. And we can understand a little bit about what Paul was talking about. Okay? And once again, we have to remember, he's got these brand new converts and he's got these Jews who think they're way up here, these Pharisees, okay? And he's just trying to pull them down. He's trying to lift the, the Gentiles up and join them together. And that's what he's trying to do, okay? So he's speaking to the Pharisees now. The new converts are not even really sure, probably a lot of them, are who Abraham really was because they're just coming into the faith, Okay. So when you see that he's talking about Abraham, you know he's directing his, his speech to the Pharisees, okay? Okay, so he says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but his due. So in other words, he's talking about earning your way into heaven, okay? You can't earn your way into heaven, okay? He says, and to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Again, his faith, what is faith? What is faith? This is faith, okay? Obedience to the law, it bears fruit, love of God, all of this is faith, okay? He's not excluding the law here. He's talking, once again, about the law separate from faith, which is all the Pharisees had. They don't have faith yet. He's trying to teach them what faith is, okay? So he says, and to the one who does work, or, or does not work, but believes in him who justified the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness, just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Okay? Very good. So, let's talk for a moment about David, okay? Was David obedient to the law? Yes, he was. Did he trip up and fall and stumble and do things he shouldn't have done? Yes, he did. Over and over and over and over again. Was David a man of God's heart? Yes, he was. Did the, the very Messiah come from the loins of David? Yes, he did. We've already seen that in the first... Uh, uh, paragraph of chapter 1 of the book of Romans. So, David, the the reason that David was forgiven because is because he repented in his heart. You know, when, when David messes up, 
You see him going back and you see him repenting. You see him falling down, wrapping himself in sackcloth and ashes and, and for days and not eating. And he was sick. He's sick because he, have, he disobeyed the things of God. And he couldn't, he couldn't hardly handle it. And God knew that in his heart he was sorrowful. He, and, and he repented of these things and did not return to these things. Okay? And was forgiven. Okay? And that's what, that's what, uh, um, a, or, uh, that's what Paul is saying. Now, was David circumcised? Yes, he certainly was. Did David follow the laws of God? Yes, he certainly did. But it was because he loved him. <coughs> and this is what Paul is trying to get through. Excuse me. And this is what Paul is trying to get through to both Pharisees and Gentiles. It's the love of God that counts. It's the circumcision of the heart. God said I, in the New Covenant, I will write my laws on their hearts and in their minds. He didn't say I'd nail my laws to the cross and you can do as you please. It's not what he says. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. That is absolutely incorrect thinking, teaching, and doctrine, and you should avoid it. It is not true. Okay, so, very good. Let's continue on. Uh, it says here, now, is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. Yes, it was. But was Abraham circumcised? Yes, he was. But it wasn't until Abraham was in his 90s that he was circumcised. God had already given him the promise while he was uncircumcised, you see. So, when you have faith... And this is what Paul's trying to say. If a young man comes to the, the truth, a young Gentile man comes to the truth of God's word, and he's studying and he's learning the word of God, he loves God, he's keeping the things of God as he learns them, but he's not circumcised yet, and he dies. Say a, a, a lion tears him to pieces on the way to Rome or, or something, okay? Is he still qualified to be saved? Does he still have the hope of salvation? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. And that's what he's saying. Uh, it, it, circumcision will come by faith because we love God. We will be led to do the things of God. We do the easy things of God. And that's what James's uh, uh, judgment was in Acts 15. Let's give them easy things. And then he says, then Moses will be read in the synagogues every Sabbath. And as they learn, their heart will grow. As they walk with the Lord, they see the blessings that they are receiving from keeping these beginning things of the law, they'll know and they'll understand what circumcision is really all about. What is circumcision of the flesh really all about? It's not a physical thing that we do. It's a spiritual thing that we do as God's people, just like baptism. Baptism is not a physical thing, even though it has water and you have to physically put someone in the water and bring them up. It is a spiritual thing that we do. We do it because of our love for the Messiah who commanded us to do so. And we want to be buried and brought up just as he did. We want to follow everything that he did and follow him. He said, follow me, do as I did. And, and Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, kept the law perfectly. And we are to do the same as best we can. If we fall because we have faith and because, because we have that propitiation for, for our sin, we can ask forgiveness for that sin and we can move away and turn away from that sin and the Holy Spirit will help us not to return to it. Okay? And we continue on. Okay? This is the only way that the law can be kept. By faith and by having that propitiation. Okay. So, let's continue on. Okay. Uh, in the blue now, this is important. It says, how then was it, it, was it counted to him? Still talking about Abraham. Was it before or after he had been circumcised? Hold on here, just a second here. Uh, I want to make sure we didn't miss anything here. I just had some notes and I didn't want to miss anything here. I think we're flying along pretty well here. <laughs> okay. And let's read this on down uh, here before we take another break. Uh, again, let's start in the blue. How then was it counted to him? Talking about Abraham. He says, was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. So again, the promise of, of Abraham being the father of all nations was given to him before he was circumcised. He wasn't circumcised yet. And God already gives him the promise, right? He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well. Okay? 
So righteousness is counted even to the uncircumcised before they're circumcised already. Okay? And to make him the father of the circumcised, who were not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. So Abraham was given blessings and promises before he was circumcised. But was Abraham circumcised? Yes, he was. And that's the point that we need to remember. Yes, now if Abraham didn't need to be circumcised, he wouldn't have been circumcised. But we know that Abraham was well into his 90s when he was circumcised. Okay, so uh, Paul is not saying, once again, that you don't have to be circumcised or you shouldn't be circumcised. He's just saying, listen, uh, faith is important, and faith comes first. And if you have faith, you'll be led to do these things on your own. You can't force, he's telling these Pharisees, you can't force these people to be circumcised. It's of no effect if you force them. Just like forcing someone to be baptized. It's of no effect. It didn't happen in their heart. They didn't want to be. They didn't understand. It wasn't because of the love of God that they were doing these things. It was just because you were forcing them. You can't force someone. Okay. So, let's continue on. He says, He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he held by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised, so that righteousness would be counted to them as well, and to make him the father of the circumcised, who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith, we know what that encompasses, that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law. It didn't come because he was circumcised. Okay, It came because he had faith and he was led to be circumcised. Okay, uh, So let's read that again. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be the heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. What is righteousness? Now we've looked at what the biblical definition of righteousness is. Obedience to God is what righteousness is. That's the definition of righteousness, okay? So, we can know and understand it. What did Peter say? Let's go back and think about that again. He said the unstable would twist the writings of Paul to their own destruction. He says they're hard to understand. The writings of Paul are hard to understand, and especially if we don't know what was written in the Old Testament, in the Torah, that he is quoting from continuously, Okay? So we need to know and we need to understand. Once again, what did Paul say? Do we nullify the law by our faith? Absolutely not. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Okay? So that's exactly what he is saying here. Okay? Let's continue on. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, uh, or to be the heirs, okay, now he's talking about those who are keeping the law apart from faith, don't have any faith, don't believe in Yeshua, just keeping the law, earning their way in. Okay? If, it, if they're to be the heirs, he says, Faith is null, and the promise is void then, because they don't have faith. They're just doing the law. So if they can get in by just doing the law without faith, then the promise is, is, is faith is null, and the, and the promise is void. He says, For the law brings wrath, but the, where there is no law, there is no transgression. Okay? That is why it depends on faith. Okay? We know what faith is. Encompasses obedience to the God because we love God in order that the promise may rest on grace and be granted to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith. What is faith? Once again, faith is all of these things. If you have faith, he who says he knows him and does not keep his commandments is what? A liar, and the truth isn't in him, right? We know that. We looked at that. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and they are not a burdensome. They're not burdensome to us, right? Upholds the law. Paul already told us. We don't, do we nullify the law by our, by our faith? No, absolutely not. On the contrary, we uphold the law. So we know what faith is here. Okay? And faith does not get rid of the law. Okay? Faith simply puts the law in the back seat, is what it does. We, we obey the law not to be saved but because we are saved and because we love him. That's why we are obedient to him, because we love him. Okay? Okay. So, uh, as we're going through this scripture, I just want us to know and continuously put, drive that home. Faith. What's he talking about? Law apart from faith. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about the law 
without faith. He's telling these Pharisees, you Pharisees, if you don't have faith, if you don't believe who Yeshua was, if you don't believe he's your Messiah, then you don't have faith. All you have is the law, and you're lost. And that's what he's trying to tell them. Okay, So don't get on these new converts about being circumcised. Okay, uh, We've already talked about that, and the judgment's already been made. In, in Acts 15, we can go back and we can read these things and know this and understand this thing. Now, uh, there was something... Uh, that I want us to read and to know and to understand. Paul, because of all of this hard-to-understand gospel, uh, was accused of preaching and teaching against the laws of God. And let's go ahead and finish this up, and then I'll take you to that scripture that shows that Paul never was against the laws of God, okay? So that's coming up. That's uh, a, a little bit of, uh, little bit of uh, anticipation there for you. Okay, so let's, let's go ahead and finish this before I take you to that, because I think it'll be more powerful at the end of this. Okay, so he says, This is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on the grace and be guaranteed to all of his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to those, uh, the ones who share the faith of Abraham, who believes that God is who he says he is, who is the father of us all, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God uh, in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence things that do not exist. In hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. What's Paul saying here? Again, we believe, many people are told today that I'm saved, I'm saved. We are not saved, technically speaking, until the end. We are not saved saved, my friends. And we've been through this before at Holy Impact Ministry. We have the hope of salvation if we have faith and we continue to the end. What does our Messiah tell us in the book uh, of Matthew, the, the 24th chapter? He says, he who endures to the end will be saved. He who endures to the end, not he who's in the middle of everything and decides to change his mind and become a Muslim to save his own life. Okay? If you do that, you will not be saved. It says, he who endures to the end will be saved. Hebrews 10 very clearly tells us that if we, after knowing the truth, if we continue to sin, there remains no sacrifice for our sins. And we have nothing to look forward to but the fiery pit. And that's just all there is to it. We, and in the book of in Romans 11, we will see this as we move into the 11th chapter of Romans. He says, you know, the, the Jews who do not believe where their branches were broken out of the olive tree. He says, and you were grafted in, you Gentile. But he says, only if you continue in his kindness. Because if you don't continue in his kindness, you too will be broken off. So are we saved right now? No, we have the hope of salvation. We must walk out our lives in the ways of Yahweh God the Father. And we must keep the faith. Once we lose the faith, uh, that is the unforgivable. That is the unfor the unpardonable sin, knowing and tasting the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and then saying, "I don't want it," and walking away and dying in your sin, uh, refusing. And and many people have done that. Many people knew the Holy Spirit was given the Holy Spirit, and then decided that they wanted to be part of the world instead, and walked away, and they blasphemed the Holy Spirit. And what does the Bible say? You can blaspheme the Son, but you cannot blaspheme the Holy Spirit. It is unforgivable. Uh, unforgivable. You cannot do it. So if I today, knowing and have tasted the fruit of the Holy Spirit, if I decide I'm just going to go be a drunk, and, a, and I'm just going to go out and be an adulterer, and I'm going to do all of these things, and just, you know, I'm just going to go with the world. I'm just going to assimilate myself with every all these pagan things and go back to the world. And I die in my sin that way then that's it. I, I will experience the second death. I will experience the second death, and I will be finished. That would be it. That would be the end of it. So we need to know and we need to understand these things. We need to know what Paul is talking about here. Okay, so let's continue on here. He says, he did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body. Now, what is he talking here about? He's talking about him being circumcised when he was in his 90s, okay? He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old. Okay, Again, he wasn't circumcised until he was up in his 90s. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. Sarah, remember, his wife was 90 years old. 
when she gave birth, okay? 90 years old, okay? And here's Abraham. He's well up in, into his night. He's almost 100 years old, and he's circumcising himself. Can you imagine uh, that? Uh, it, it is just uh, remarkable when we look at Abraham and Abraham's life and what he went through and the promises that God gave him before he was circumcised. And this is the point that Paul's trying to make to these Pharisees. These people are new. Don't count them out and don't think that they're not part of uh, this covenant and they don't have hope of salvation because you haven't forced them to be circumcised. You can't do that. That's not how it goes. Faith comes first. This, the law and the obedience to the things of God and keeping his Sabbaths and keeping his laws and keeping his precepts and keeping his commandments, that will follow if you have this first. This must come first. You can't put the horse before the cart. And that's what he's telling the Pharisees. And you can't have the law without faith. And that's what many of these Pharisees have always had. They just had the, they just had the law without faith. And they just counted on the law. They earned their way into heaven because their hearts had turned cold. They didn't keep the laws anymore because they loved God. They kept the laws because they were earning their way into heaven, you see. And it was all about their posture and their stature. Okay, and this is what Yeshua came to break and to, to help them to see. Look, this is sin. This is what it looks like. This is where you're going. This is what's going to happen if you continue. And he came to be a propitiation, the payment for our sin. If we have faith and believe. And he who says he knows him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. This is a perfect way for us to see and know whether a man is a, a wolf in sheep's clothing or not. We can know these things. Simplest thing is keeping God's seventh day Sabbath. Is he keeping that? If he's not, he's a liar, and the truth is not in him. If he's not keeping God's Sabbath, we can know that. I mean, that's a simple thing to be able to see and to know, to understand. Okay, so... It says, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. We become, once again, we can become stronger in faith the longer we walk in faith, the more the, this means to us. Obedience to the law, written in my heart and in my mind, not nailed to the cross. Okay? Very good. So, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but also for our sake. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised up for our justification so that we could finally keep the law just as he kept the law. And when we fall or when we trip and when we make a mistake, we now, because of him, we can come to the Father and admit our sin, ask for forgiveness, and we will have the Holy Spirit to help us repent, which means to turn away from our sin. And without this propitiation, without this ability to come to the Father, uh, what is no one comes to the Father but through the Son. Okay, We know that through Scripture. We must come to the Father through the Son. Anyone who prays and does not pray in the name of Yeshua Mashiach, his prayer is not heard. We know we cannot come to the Father without coming through the Son. Okay, That's why he came, to connect us to God and to keep the, uh, the northern kingdom that was divorced to bring them back and to rebuild that olive tree, to put the two sticks back together, okay? So that the northern and the southern kingdoms, once again, would become the chosen people, the bride of, of Yahweh God the Father. Okay, this all just flows so very nicely if we know and we understand. Now, uh, before I let you go, I want to just take you over to Acts 21.19. Because Paul was accused of not keeping the law and preaching against the law. Let's read that very quickly. And we're going to go right down here. Now, this is what is being said. It says, Then some of the inherent Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus Christ over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you. Well, let me see here. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, that's not what I'm supposed to be reading. I'm supposed to be down here in 26. 
Uh, I want uh, 26. This is what I want. Okay, and I thought I highlighted this, but I must have done it on my other computer, and I didn't do it uh, on this one. Let's read this. It says, And you see in here that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that God made his uh, with hands are not gods. And there is danger not only... Uh, let's see here. Da -da -da -da. That's not what I want either. Where am I at here? I've lost myself. There we go. This is what I want. Okay, very good. I'm looking at my paper instead of listening to my brain here. That's the third time's a charm. Okay. Now, here we go. It says, uh, let's go ahead and read this as well. We're going to read this because this is where Paul is accused of not keeping the law. He says, on the following day, Paul went in with us to James and all the elders were present. After greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified God and they said to him, you see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews who, are, who have believed, okay? So they're now having faith, and they are all zealous for the law, okay? And they have been told about you, now listen to this, and they have been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, okay? Telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to their customs, okay? So because Paul's writings are hard to understand, and because he has been trying to knock these Pharisees down, putting their feet on the ground, and, and to weld them together with these Gentiles, okay, and to forsake this circumcision group that says, you've got to be circumcised, you've got to be circumcised, you've got to be circumcised, scaring off all of his new converts, okay? Now there, there are some people that have listened to this, and they think that Paul's teaching against circumcision and telling them not to circumcise their children and to walk uh, against the laws of God, okay? So he's being accused here. So then it goes on and it says, well, so what is to be done? Okay, then what is to be done? So here's what's to be done. It says, they will certainly hear that you have come. Do therefore what we tell you. Now, this is the, these are the elders at Jerusalem, and this is what they're telling Paul to do. Pay attention to this now, because this part is very important. It says, we have four men who are under a vow. Take these men and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. Now, what, what are they talking about here? They're talking about a Nezerite vow. When you took a Nezerite vow, even Paul had taken a Nezerite vow, there was a period of time when you did not shave your hair, you could not take a, partake of any strong drink. Uh, there were many other things that you were not allowed to do when you took a Nezerite vow for a period of so many years. And when this Nezerite vow was done, then you had to shave your head, and there were all kinds of animals and different things that you had to do to cleanse yourself and uh, to come out of that Nezerite vow uh, to say, I'm done with my vow, and uh, I'm back in, in normal living sequence, okay? So a Nezerite vow was to become closer to God and to do just go out into the wilderness. They ate locusts, and they, they denied themselves, and they let their hair grow, and no razor was allowed to touch themselves. So this is what the Nezerite vow was about. And, and these men had taken a Nezerite vow to become closer to Yahweh God the Father. So the elders are telling him, we have four men that are under this Nezerite vow. Take these men and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. Thus, he says, that way all will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you but that you yourself also live in observance of the law. Do we see that, my friends? I hope and I pray that we see that. He says, this way, all everyone will know that there's nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance of the law. Paul lived in observance of the law. He says, but as for the Gentiles who have believed, we have sent a letter out with our judgment that they should abstain from what from uh, sacrificed idols, uh, or abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols, and from blood, and from what has been strangled, and from sexual immorality. Again, this was the judgment of James, 
And he said in Acts 15, he said, let's get them to do these four things first, then they'll hear the law of Moses being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day, seventh day Sabbath on Saturday, and they'll know and they'll understand uh, what the law is, and they'll be driven by their faith to be obedient to the things of God. They'll do this circumcision in their own heart the way it should be, and then it will be a sanctified circumcision because they it will have been done spiritually, not because you physically force them to. Okay? So here we see that Paul was accused because of his writings of uh, telling people that they don't have to circumcise their children and they don't have to obey the law. Okay, so Paul had to take these four men down and show the whole community that, hey, I, I am observant to the law. I'm not preaching against the law. That's not what I'm saying. Okay, and uh, it says very clearly, the elders say right here, so that, uh, so that you yourself also live in observance with the law. So we know that Paul lived in observance with the law, and he was not preaching against the law. Again, I want you to read uh, this, Acts 21, 18 through 25, and no one understand uh, what happened and why many of these Pharisees, because many of these Pharisees were just angry with Paul because it seemed like he was preaching against the law. He was not. He was not preaching, not saying you don't have to be circumcised or you shouldn't be circumcised. He's saying you have to be circumcised in the right way. You have to be circumcised by your faith. Your faith must lead you to be circumcised. You can't have the law apart from faith and just have the law as you have done in the past. Okay? So, very, very interesting information here, and I hope that we can know and we can see these things. I'm sorry about that uh, screw up there. I had wrote down the uh, scripture that I wanted to take us to, to prove these things out, and uh, my old eyes just aren't what they used to be. These numbers are kind of small on my computer here. But uh, at any rate, I think that you know and understand what we were trying to say here. Okay. So, again, that is Romans chapter 3 and 4 that we have completed. Again, the writings of uh, the Apostle Paul, just as Peter said, difficult to understand if we don't understand what was in the Torah. We know that Abraham was selected by God because he kept his laws and his commandments and his precepts, and he heard his voice, and he had faith. Yes, faith encompasses, and I want to just show that to us again, all of these things. So if you have faith, Paul knew that you would be circumcised. He knew that you would do these things, but you would do them spiritually. You would do them because you love God and because you know that that's what God, it pleases God. Okay? Again, it's not works. It's not something to earn our way into heaven. It's because we love God. He who says he knows him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. And Paul said very clearly, very, very clearly, he said, Do we nullify the law by our faith? Absolutely not. On the contrary, we uphold the law. With that being said, I am Pastor Scott Belaine with HolyImpactMinistries.com. I'd like to thank you so very much for spending your time with me. You know, if you were, if you were, uh, if you're still here after all of that, uh, I know that you have a thirst for knowledge. You have a drive to know the truth. And I commend you for that. And I hope and I pray that you understood what we are saying here today. And uh, again, I will pray for all who, who see this video, that they may have the discernment to know and to understand that we cannot just do as thou wilt, as many pastors, preachers, and popes and bishops teach today. Uh, there is no such thing as once saved, always saved. At any point in time, any one of us could be led astray and drug off by that prowling lion who is prowling around looking to see whom he may devour. We could be taken and drug off into the jungle and torn apart. Uh, and we want to protect ourselves and protect our children from these things. We want, us, we want them to know. And, and again, what is the... Uh, the very first commandment, uh, in, uh, the greatest commandment, and that is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your strength. Let me take you over. Before I let you go, I just want you to see this. Okay, Deuteronomy, and we're going to go to 6. This is in the Matthew where they ask Yeshua what the greatest commandment was. This is where he got it, from Deuteronomy 6.5. Let's read it. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. 
And these words that I command you today shall be on where? Your heart. That's what we've been talking about this whole time. On your heart. Not nailed to the cross. On your heart. The new covenant is not does not say that I'm going to nail my laws to the cross. It says I'm going to write them in those, my people's hearts and in their mind. He says, and these words I command you today shall be on your heart. Nothing's changed. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on your doorposts of your house and on your gates. My friends, I hope this clears up any confusion, or at least helps to begin to, to, to clear up any confusion. I know that we have been taught wrongly for generations. But the truth of God's Word is the truth of God's Word. And if we read it for ourselves, we can know and understand what God's Word does and does not say. All of these different things that the world is into, and flying reindeer, and magical, immortal fat men that come out of the fireplace to give our children gifts, and Easter bunnies, and Valentines, and, uh, and Halloween, and praying to the dead saints. Nowhere does it say in the Bible to pray to anyone other than Yahweh God the Father. And there is one mediator, and that is Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. There is one mediator. Nowhere does it say to pray to Mary. Nowhere does it say to pray to David, or to Peter, or to Paul or any other saint. My friends, we need to know what the truth is, and we need to go in wearing the full armor of God. And if you have not read your Bible, you do not have the full armor of God. If you've been sitting in a pew for 45 minutes on the wrong day of the week, listening to a man you barely know preach out of the back half of the book while programming you not to read the first half, you are going to be lost. We are commanded to show ourselves approved, to study to show ourselves approved. And this is what this is all about, studying to show ourselves approved. Read the Word of God for yourself. He is our instructor. He is our Father. He is the only teacher that we need. With all of that being said, I just want to say God bless you and thank you for sharing your time with us here at HolyImpactMinistries.com and on our Bible study night again, Wednesday night, 8 o'clock, we will be diving into the fifth chapter of the book of Romans. My hope and my prayer is that the grace and the peace of God would be with you and your family and that the hand of God would be upon you and his protection would be upon you until we meet again. We will see you next Wednesday at 8 o'clock, if not before. Remember, don't you can also catch us on our Seventh-day Sabbath program uh, that comes out at Saturday. We try to have that out by 9 o'clock. You can visit us at holyimpactministries.com for all of our video teachings and our Bible studies as well. God bless you. And remember, you can share these. They, you can download these. They are free for you to take and do as you please. Please just do not sell them. With all that being said, God bless you and Shalom.